Welcome everybody um, to the postgraduate history taster evening. Uh, my name is Andrea Yanko and I'm the subject head of history within the School of History, Religions and Philosophies. And I'm also teaching modules on Chinese and gender history within the MA history program. So the purpose of this evening um, is to give you a taste, right? It's a taster evening um, of what the MA history program at SOAS is like. And uh, we made a rather last minute decision. So apologies for this, if you expected a lecture um, on, on plague in Manchuria, but we made a last minute decision to, to change this, to um, introduce a couple of our modules um, that, I, that we thought would be a better way to, to give you an impression of what the history program um, would be like than, than just one lecture on one particular topic. So I hope this is not a huge um, disappointment for, for everybody who's here today. Um, so present with me um, this, this evening is uh, Sean Lowe, who is um, one of our student ambassadors, um, who will be happy to um, answer any questions you might have about um, the department or maybe SOAS more generally, what it's like to be a student at SOAS. Um, and then I have a couple of colleagues and, and another colleague from the recruitment team. And maybe I just ask everybody to briefly introduce yourselves if, if that's okay. Um, I don't know, Eleanor, would you like to start? Sure, um, I'm Eleanor Newbegin, and I'm a historian of modern South Asia, uh, and more recently uh, of education also, which is what I'm teaching on in the MA. Should I pass over to Wayne? Uh, my name is Wayne Dooling, and I'm an historian of Southern Africa, and I teach a number of courses on Southern Africa and African history more broadly in the department. Yes, my, uh, hello, my name is Lars Lahman. And um, I would have been the plague doctor tonight, but um, uh, <laughs> I'm uh, happy to answer questions um, relating to Manchuria or to the plague at any time. Uh, my special field is uh, China, especially the development of um, uh, the Qing Empire and the ethnicities within it. Um, religion, uh, especially uh, subversive popular religions, and um, uh, also the connections between Eastern Asia and Central Asia. Um, my name is Jay Dakar um, I'm a historian of modern Middle Eastern history, uh, modern Middle East, uh, with a focus on the Ottoman Empire. Um, and I am also the convener of the MA uh, history program um, as well. Okay, so um, I think Sean, Sean is not here, so maybe we just move on then. Um, so maybe just to very briefly say what we're going to do, um, um, each of us, um, not each of us, not Shada, unfortunately, but four of us will give you a very brief um, kind of insight into, into one of our MA modules. Um, and, and then Shada will briefly introduce what the structure of the MA history uh, program looks like. Um, and right, um, I guess during the whole kind of um, series of, of short talks, I would just like to invite you to, um, I mean, to add your, your questions and then comments that, that you might have in, in the Q&A um, section of, of this page. Sorry, I'm kind of used to, to, to ask you to do this via the chat, but that's, that's not what we're doing today. So you have to use the Q&A button. And please do that whenever you have a question so that we can see what concerns and issues come up um, as we speak. Um, and maybe it's fine also to interrupt um, uh, if, if that's appropriate. Um, did I say that? So at the end, um, Cheda will then um, introduce um, the, the program and, and maybe you have more specific questions about that too. So I just basically like to, um, yeah, to start, I hope this, this kind of arrangement is, is okay with everybody and would like to start with, with Eleanor, who's going to um, talk about a, a very new and um, in a way provocative model because, uh, module because it, it kind of comes, um, provides or, um, a very critical approach to so as, as an institution itself is called colonial curricula. And I, I hand over to you, um, Eleanor, please. Thanks, Andrea. Yeah, so I'm, I teach a, an optional course on the MA History Programme called Colonial Curricula, Empire and Education at SOAS and Beyond. And this is a course that I've developed over the last few years, really from the experience of teaching at SOAS and 
Um, I've, I've run it now for a couple of years and it's had a lot of, it, it's being developed in conversation with the students studying it. So it's quite an interactive course. And the idea behind it is to explore the historical relationship between empire and education generally, but in particular through the institu institution you'd be studying at through SOAS itself. So some of you may know, but some of you may not know that SOAS was set up in 1916 specifically to train civil servants for service in the British Empire, but also to work with businessmen who had links across the empire and also with missionaries. And it also hosted a lot of students, well, some students from within the empire in, in London too. So there's a lot of questions in SOAS itself. What, what is this imperial institution doing at the heart of the colonial metropole? And what does that mean today for SOAS um, and, and our idea of global London also? So the course looks both at the history of the institution and at the legacies of that, of that history for, for all of us today as we work in SOAS. So the course is trans-regional. In one sense, it takes SOAS at its heart. It takes London and the institution at its heart and uses that to look out on a series of geographical sites, but also to ask theoretical questions. So we ask how Africa, Asia and the Middle East are situated as objects of study at SOAS and how, where and why we can engage with them differently um, as frameworks through which to study the world. What does it mean to do that? How, how can we look at the regions that SOAS is based in and, and take what we might want to call a more decolonial approach? So as, as well as this study of history, the course engages with contemporary discussions around decolonizing methodologies and the way that they're used within academia, but also political debates. And as Andrea said, there's a provocative element to the course. We ask what decolonization means, how it works, and, and keep revisiting that term through the, the, the duration of the course. The way that the course is organized is that there are some, there's an introductory session, there's a session specifically on methodologies, on the different kind of approaches that we can use for thinking about decolonizing, but also about education itself, how education works as a political tool and how each year the cohort wants to run the classroom. We make collective decisions about how that space works and how we work together. But then the course is organized around disciplinary basis. So we look, start looking at languages. We think about the, the evolution of the history of discipline, the, the, the evolution of the discipline of history, uh, of history of art um, and ideas of museums, anthropology, development studies. Um, and each week we look at how that discipline has evolved in relationship to empire, how it works in SOAS specifically, but we also ask what we could do to change that discipline, to, to contest its relationship with empire and make that discipline do something else. So we ask this, it's not just about reflecting on how empire um, makes academia a, 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 a contested, a, a, a racialized, a racist space. It's also thinking about what we can do to, to contest that also. Um, we taught that the course is taught through discussions each week. It's very definitely seminar led, student led in terms of the way in which the discussions work. There's ideas about reflective practice that are built into each session and into the assignments too. And the final piece of work that you will do in the course is um, creating an output that takes what you've learned from the course to a non-academic audience. So it really, through several stages, it's thinking about what the place of the university is and how it can engage with society more widely um, to break down some of the, the barriers that that are being contested, that are being discussed and talked about in terms of the decolonizing debate. Thanks. Wayne, am I- right, Thank you. Oh, oh thank sorry. You. No, Andrea, I'll pass to you, sorry. No, it's okay, thank you, Eleanor. Uh, that was very concise and to the point. I, I think I had Lars next in my list, if that's okay. It's Lars there. If not, maybe Wayne. Oh, okay. Um, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> yes, this is, um, <laughs> um, well, my, my course, the course that I would like to introduce is uh, called um, Nationhood and its alternatives and, and, and it deals with China. It's um, uh, probably uh, asking too much to try to define everything uh, in uh, such a brief period of time, but we'll be looking at um, um, 
at the, not at the gestation of China, but at the gestation, at the creation of the uh, idea of China as a nation. And um, this is something that goes beyond nationalism. We'll also look at nationalism, both in its um, uh, more conservative and in its more socialist um, uh, uh, appearance. But importantly, um, we'll be looking at the um, uh, at the, um, the very uh, uh, the very stimulating intellectual environment that the late nineteenth century and the the first, especially the first half of the 20th century created in China. And this is uh, something where this is an environment where we need a, um, a lot of uh, materials, which I've, uh, I'm not sure whether it's completely legal, but I, I managed to integrate them into the course. And um, these, uh, with these materials, uh, we work both in the classroom or in the virtual classroom this year, uh, and um, then also um, in terms of uh, projects with the individuals, with the individual students, or so with you if you want to join this course. And then um, many of our students also continue to use uh, similar themes that we discussed in the course for their dissertation. So this is something that is worth remembering. And it's structured chronologically, like most uh, history classes. So we begin actually with the um, imperial legacy and what especially what it means for the Qing Empire, which is a multi-ethnic, a polyethnic empire. And then uh, we uh, progress towards the, the crisis point at the um, transition to the Republican era. So in the uh, late 19th and early 20th centuries, and we'll look at the, the different representatives of um, uh, social and political power that could be um, at the local uh, level that could be um, uh, well, representatives of uh, uh, peasant society um, at the more advanced level, this could be, um, uh, th that could be government ministers, but it uh, could also be those who interacted with them. So, for example, uh, Western missionaries or um, uh, uh, intellectuals who had arrived from Korea and from Japan or from Vietnam and who interacted uh, in a number of ways. And then uh, it follows the, um, the sometimes turbulent um, um, trajectory of the uh, Republic of China with uh, different periods of warfare, but then also the intellectual, intellectual um, uh, debates which took place at various stages, for example, during the May 4th period or during the um, uh, period of the um, anti-imperialist, anti-foreign um, demonstrations of the 1920s. Then we enter the uh, period of the uh, uh, war with uh, Japan and also the civil war between the, um, um, the nationalist forces and the communists. And finally, and this is a, um, a, an aspect which I've uh, strengthened over the past uh, a couple of years, uh, the early People's Republic, which is a, um, a, perhaps surprisingly, a, an experimental ground of different approaches towards nationalism. And uh, this is something where uh, received wisdom uh, often clashes with reality. And um, we'll also um, look at the relationship between the uh, so-called Han Chinese majority and the uh, ethnic minorities, which is, of course, um, uh, right now in the media. Great, thank you, Lars. Um... I mean, as I said, if you have questions, just just um, um, write them into the Q and A um, section, and, and we'll be able to pick them up either now or later. Um, Wayne, could I invite you to to speak to your module, please? Thank you, Andrea. Um, so I teach a module called Race Segregation and Apartheid in Twentieth Century South Africa. So it's a it's a 10 week module, like all of our MA modules, half a term, uh, half a year, in other words. Um, so, you know, it's quite, quite a lot that we have to squeeze into a single term. Um, so, the course is uh, quite obviously about the second half of the 20th century, and it's about, um, you know, for anybody who knows anything about South Africa will know that, of course, it's, you know, on a, on a, on a, in a kind of global in the global scheme of things, it's the country that experiences the most extreme form of legislated racial segregation anywhere in the world in the, all of the 20th century. Let, you know, other, other countries, of course, have 
form of, uh, forms of racial discrimination too, but in South Africa it's legislated, and which is why South Africa becomes such a uh, you know international cause in um, the second half of the 20th century. Um, and there's, you know, there are very many different ways in which one could approach a subject like this. Um, so one approach would be, you know, a strongly intellectual history approach, which is to look at, you know, what what it is about race that, um, uh, or, or racial ideology, I should say, what is it about racial ideology that is specific or unique to South Africa? That's not what this course will be doing. <laughs> and the course is. Um, and the other, the other way in which one could approach the course, of course, is to look at um, overwhelming, to look, overwhelmingly to look at um, uh, the kind of nationalist uh, struggles that emerge in opposition to apartheid. And the course has some of that, but in fact, most of the course is about the way in which ordinary people experienced um, this particular social and economic milieu. So. Um, in fact, I was struck the other day when I got to week eight of the course and I discovered this the very first time that I mentioned the African National Congress, which is, of course, the main, uh, the main nationalist party that emerges. And I was quite proud of that fact. <laughs> um, it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it wasn't deliberate or conscious, but that's, uh, that's how it ended up um, as being. So, so what is the course about? So it's about, like I said, it's about the way in which ordinary people uh, experience daily life in apartheid South Africa. So a lot of it is about the consequences of um, urbanization, for example, about the kinds of lives that people experience in an urban context under extreme forms of racial discrimination. So one uh, issues that might seem mundane, but are actually fundamental to, the, uh, to people's daily existence. So something like housing, for example, forms a big and important part of the course, or I should say the lack of housing at people's responses to it, but issues of crime and uh, criminal violence. Um, one particularly interesting theme is that of uh, popular culture um, and to look at the ways in which um, people could people could express themselves in uh, in the arts or in different you know, art, art, artistic ways um, under these conditions of extreme uh, uh, poverty and discrimination. There's one course, there's one week, for example, uh, where we have a kind of micro study of one particular jazz track. And the interesting thing about this particular jazz track is it's, it's sometimes described as the song that fought apartheid. And the interesting thing about it is I think that the actual track is about uh, 12 minutes long, something like that, but there's one line of lyrics in it. <laughs> so, so how does how does how does the how does the jazz track with a single line of lyrics um, become a song that fights apart? So those are the sorts of things that um, that interest me, and I and I and I, you know, I brought to try to bring to the center of the course. But then also, of course, we do study formal politics, um, student resistance, student. Um, uh, um, uh, student engagement with the apartheid state, the nature of the police state that uh, the apartheid state becomes, uh, the big uprisings of the 1970s and 1980s, um, and then of course South Africa in the region, and the, the demise of apartheid which is very much tied to decolonization elsewhere in the region, uh, and, and the, the course ends, um, the, the course ends in the mid-1990s. Thanks, Andrea. Hey, thank you, Wayne. Um, fascinating. I like the one line 10 minute song. <laughs> it's very good. You have to show it to me at some point. Um, okay, so um, what you've seen so far, I mean, is um, Eleanor's quite overarching um, module that um, addresses many of the issues that are, in a way, at the core of the institution. Um, and then some of the regional modules that we have on our program. And, and the final one that we would like to introduce to you is, is um, a, a module that we're running for the first time this year, which is called Historical Perspectives on Gender in Asia, Africa and the Middle East. So from the title, you will see that it tries to bring together all the regions that we study at SOAS. Um, and the way we're doing it, and that's something we want to do more in the future, um, is, is to bring um, I mean, to, to co-teach this course, basically, to, to have um, 
um, a, a, in, in this case, four colleagues who are experts in different regions working together to um, explore, in this case, the, the kind of theme of, I mean, the broad theme that almost includes everything really of gender in, in, in one module. Um, so obviously, if you're interested in the history of particular regions, that's something that I, I think SOAS is a very good place um, to come to study um, if you want to do that. And, and maybe just to highlight one thing, there is also um, a two-year MA uh, program with intensive language um, that I kind of would like to promote a bit more. We, we have a couple of languages that are particularly popular within that. But obviously, if you're interested in, in a, if you have a strong interest in a particular region, it makes sense to also think about studying the language that gives you better access to it. Um, so what, what this particular module about um, gender history is about is, is to, to move beyond the silos of our own specialisms in a way it can, can can become something like that and to connect different sets of knowledges um, in a way that enables multiple perspectives and a genuine alternative to to those dominant um, narratives and approaches that that are i mean the western the anglo-european anglo-american kind of uh, view in a kind of alternative that decenters and rebalances these familiar accounts and offers new insights. So it's, it's this idea of kind of so as it being um, an institution that allows you to to look at the world from a, a different perspective to to think um, in in terms that I mean basically to try to maybe change and and make this place a better world or something. Sorry, I'm getting too romantic about all these things. Um, so one of the concerns of this particular module um, is to, to highlight gendered histories in non-Western spaces before colonialism. So I'm not going to tell you all the different things we cover in this course, um, at, uh, all the four people involved in, in it bring different things to it. Uh, but I just wanted to give you one example. And I feel a bit reluctant. I've, I have prepared a couple of slides, but as nobody else has used slides, should I use them? <laughs> I'm a bit, bit unsure about it. But maybe I just do this and I'll, I'll share um, a couple of slides. I hope it will work. Um, can you see this? Does it make sense? Okay, so I need to go back to, it doesn't work, I should have practiced this before. Okay, anyway, um, so many of you will be familiar with colonial accounts of widow immolation in India, for example, but far less with the politics of gendered space under Mughal rule. So that's, that's one of the things um, that um, one of my colleagues wants to bring into this course. So if we then move to the Chinese example that I'm more familiar uh, with, um, we have the custom of foot binding that has been described in many ways by foreign, mostly missionary observers in the late 19th century, with the effect of creating an image of China as the exotic, cruel and backward other. And it's only very recently that a new historiography has highlighted an entirely different aspect um, that sees foot binding as a form of bodily and cultural refinement alongside accomplishments in the arts and high levels of literacy, and all these things were key aspects of the courtesan culture that flourished in the late 16th and early 17th century. It's then interesting to see that the subsequent historical trajectory brought a form of moral orthodoxy and sexual and in many, and many other constraints for women in particular that does not look too different from what is often described as Victorian morality. Um, so you, you find, I mean, you could write the history of China in that respect as, as a a word that was kind of discovered and, and civilized by kind of Western imperialism who found all these um, uh, cruel uh, practices um, that um, I mean, people through the um, unequal treaties um, systems of extraterritoriality wanted to protect Westerners in China from. But um, on the other hand, if, if you take an internal perspectives and see how things were perceived by the people who were living this, in, in their own culture, you come to quite different accounts of, of very similar customs. And um, to, to show you this kind of trajectory, that's, that's why I just wanted to um, basically go through these slides. So this is um, talking about fluidity, cultural, social, gender, uh, probably one of the most famous um, courtesans of this period, Liu Ruxi. Um, and this shows her famously um, in male attire, a kind of um, a male um, Taoist um, robe. 
uh, that she used to court um, the man that she married not much later, who was a very famous uh, scholar at that time. Um, so it's kind of kind of reversing um, all the, the established kind of gender categories. Um, and I'm basically trying to, as I, I realize, I'm not having, um, I'm not going to have enough time to, to tell you the, the entire story. There's lots of really interesting aspects to it. But if we move on through the history, in, so in this earlier period, um, this, these courtesans, I mean, they're basically um, elite prostitutes, if you want. Uh, but they ended up being uh, moral icons, models to be emulated by the wives and daughters of the elite in the late Ming and early Qing period. When we move into the Qing, this whole thing disappears and we get a, a very kind of tight moral orthodoxy uh, that just tries to put women into their place and um, consolidate patriarchal structures uh, that are then perceived to be almost the kind of basis, uh, social, uh, moral basis of the empire that the Qing built. And this is physically manifest in, in structures such as these arches that commemorate and celebrate female virtue. Um, so it's just one example of, of the things we, we are talking about in, in this module. And I'll stop here because I realize that I've taken most of the time um, and hand over to, to Cheda. Um, so let me quickly share my screen. So you'll have what I have is the, the program structure. So you can have the uh, details on the screen. Um, sorry. So um, I will not uh, take up much time, so we'll have at least um, a, a few minutes to d discuss things. Um, so, I mean, uh, so I'll just say a few things in addition um, to, to what my colleagues said, um, and uh, these will be more like program related points. Um, the four modules that, uh, that Eleanor, um, uh, Large, Wayne, and um, Andrea uh, just introduced are of course part of a much larger group of uh, courses that are offered by the history department and also other departments as well. I mean, you can see on the, um, on the screen a fuller list of courses. This is not really the final list. Um, there might be still a few changes uh, for next year, but um, this is a much fuller list uh, that you can see on the, uh, on the screen. And um, some of the most of these courses are um, offered by the history department, but there are other courses offered by other departments like, like um, East Asian studies, near Middle East uh, studies, um, that uh, those courses that are historical in, in, uh, in content and, and character that are added to this list. And um, in addition um, to, to those it might be uh, related to um, one of the questions, uh, Cindy's questions, uh, question um, earlier in the in the Q and A um, section, um, that um, there are also um, what we call open options um, that are um, offered by other departments that are not necessarily historical, but that might inform your, might be related to your um, research interests um, or you know um, your. Um, um, your dissertation study, or generally um, that that might inform your um, your interest um, in 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 general. So um, this is um, this is just really a small sample of um, courses that are offered by uh, different departments. That um, just to give you an idea. Um, for the full uh, list, you can uh, type. You can go to the SOAS uh, webpage and type in PGT Open. Uh, course options and you'll get the full list that each department has a set of courses that you can um, you can um, you can take as part of your um, part of your um, study uh, here at SOAS. Um, so just to give um, a bit of uh, an idea about how you mix and match these uh, things so you there's um, the program um, or programs actually there are two programs that are currently based in, in the history department. One is the MA history and the other one is MA history with, um, uh, with um, intensive language study that, uh, that um, Andrea mentioned earlier. 
Um, the, the first of these MA history is, uh, requires uh, 180 credits in, in total and 60 um, of that will be the dissertation. The dissertation is a 10,000 word essay, which is relatively short. It's, it's an article length um, uh, study, which is expectedly uh, based on um, primary sources. It's, um, it's a year long um, effort really um, that, uh, that produces in the end a, a, an article uh, length um, work, original work. Um, and um, the, um, the other um, uh, bit that's uh, part of the, um, the, the um, uh, 180 credits is the core module that um, I think uh, Pratik um, asked about. Um, the, the core module, Debating Past, Crafting uh, Histories, is a year-long year course. It really works as the hub for the entire cohort. That it didn't work as such this year because everything was, was delivered online, uh, but it really um, uh, serves to that purpose as well. It brings the entire cohort together. It meets um, two or three hours per week, and um, it's, it's a forum for discussion and um, and um, uh, sharing experiences. And uh, to, to answer Pratik's question, it, it, the, the, the core, I mean, it's a, a 20 week uh, seminar uh, and it touches upon uh, on all main um, areas of inquiry, um, either methodologically or thematically. And just to give you an idea, um, the, the seminar, I mean, that each week has titles like national and imperial histories, um, Marxism and history from below, um, postmodernism and the cultural turn, world history, gender, sexuality in the body, urban history, oceanic histories, uh, ref um, the, the study of the archive, oral history, memory, um, and um, archaeology, material culture. So it gives you a, a very a expensive, a comprehensive idea of how you approach your topic and your uh, your research uh, interests um, in general. And apart from, uh, from these, um, you have um, 120 credits, um, uh, sorry, um, 90 credits uh, that, that uh, you will have to um, take up as, as courses. And um, let me just, uh, quickly go to this, um, to this, um, um, sorry, um, that gives you a better idea um, that um, 90 credits that you will fill up with um, the, the uh, list A courses that I uh, showed you, the, the courses that are offered by the history department um, or um, others of uh, historical content, and also 30 credits of um, of um, open um, option uh, courses. And uh, to add to that, of course, um, there are a wide variety of taught language courses at SOAS, uh, which you can take and make part of your, um, uh, your study um, coursework um, in the uh, program. And um, speaking of languages, uh, let me say just very um, a few things on the um, MA History Intensive Language Program, which is really uh, the MA history program with an added um, language, intensive language component. Um, and um, that um, is um, uh, credit wise, it's uh, 350 credits and uh, the, the, um, the, the dissertation and the debating pass, a core module debating pass would be the same. Um, added to it is the 45 credits intensive language study um, at an overseas location, which um, I think is uh, currently running only for Arabic, maybe for Persian, uh, but please uh, check back with me um, over the next weeks, next month or so um, to, um, to see um, what languages uh, we will be um, able to um, run in terms of uh, summer uh, school uh, 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 or summer abroad study. Um, it's um, a practically a very similar structure, as I said, um, I mean, this is a two year program as opposed to one year program MA uh, history. Um, 
if if you take it as as a as a full time um, um, a study, uh, but. Um, you can see here that uh, the, the full the, the total credits are uh, divided into um, two years and then um, um, supplied with uh, or added with uh, the, the um, language intensive language study um, that is part of the uh, program. Um, so just a, a quick note on the dissertation that I just mentioned. Um, and for both of these programs, it's at the core of the, the study and it's kind of your um, basically that the um, uh, the, the uh, beacon of what you will be doing uh, within the within the program. Um, it it takes a lot of work and dedication, but it's also the most rewarding part of the uh, of the um, of the study uh, of the uh, of the program as well, where you write your own history, uh, you conduct research. And you make often a genuine uh, contribution um, to the field of history. Um, so, I mean, I guess that's all I have to say. A bit rushed, um, but um, we can just um, open up to questions, um, I guess. Um, and um, yeah. Okay, thank you, Cheda. Um, yeah, right. So, <laughs> open up to questions. I, I mean, I've seen there's a couple of questions that Eleanor um, um, was kind enough to answer already in the chat. Maybe this one question about language. I, I don't know if everybody has seen that. Obviously, you don't have to uh, do the two-year program in order to study a language. So you'll always be able to, um, to pick one language module per term also in the one-year program. And, and you can do these at different levels. So you would probably have to contact the languages and cultures department to, um, to get an assessment as to kind of which of the modules that they offer would be appropriate for whatever the level of your language is. And I, I believe there are also many that you can start from scratch really. And uh, actually, if I could just add to this, um, in particular, if you're looking at uh, continuing with a PhD, then uh, it w might make uh, immense sense to uh, start with your language uh, training well before that date, because uh, you will need to have, if you do a literary, sorry, if you do um, a PhD in history, then you will need to um, use sources which are likely to be very well, literary rather than colloquial, and then secondly, also uh, quite a bit older than uh, the language uh, that is spoken today, the languages that are spoken today. So um, it, it makes uh, great sense to start during your MA studies already. Apologies, I'm going to have to sign off just for another appointment, but it's it's great to meet you all in this space and, and I hope just to say as well as getting in touch with Cheda, do feel free to get in touch with us too if you've got any questions about courses. Thanks a lot. Okay, great. Thank you, Eleanor. Great. Um, okay, we have one question here. Maybe we can just um, answer it live if that's okay. So the question is, can we have advisors across departments for our thesis? Um, and I'd say in principle, yes, so it depends a bit on your topic, but um, if it's a topic that um, we feel or you feel we don't have enough expertise in the department um, to, to provide you with adequate supervision, then we definitely can uh, look in to, to other departments to, to find um, dissertation supervisors for you. Jada, is that correct? Sorry, I kind of yeah. should have left this to you, I just realized. <laughs> We, we do have a joint supervision with other departments, like anthropology, for instance. Um, if, if a student thinks, and as to, to just uh, repeat what Andrea said, really, um, if a student thinks that it, she or he would benefit uh, from, from joint supervision, um, then um, absolutely that's, uh, that's uh, doable. Um, of course, I mean, given that, um, provided that the other that the other uh, supervisor will be willing to su supervise the dissertation, that's um, absolutely doable. Okay. 
don't know, do we have more questions? I mean, it's, it's also true the other way around. I mean, that we have close relations in a sense with colleagues in the area studies departments in particular, um, as, as we have many students studying, I mean, for example, Chinese studies or um, uh, Middle Eastern studies, South Asian studies who come to take history courses. Um, so it's, it's quite common that, that we have colleagues from history supervising area studies dissertations and the other way around. And some of our colleagues in area studies, they are actually historians. So they are already supervising topics which are closely related. And if you have inter-regional uh, uh, topics, then you, you end up supervising them together with the other, um, uh, well, with the other historical supervisor, yes. Mm. Um, there is a question uh, from Harry. Um, if our general thesis idea doesn't have a module which links to it directly, would you imagine that would have an effect on our project? Before dissertation supervision, you don't really link to a, a module, um, you link to the supervisor. And um, supervisors have usually a kind of like a wider um, area of expertise than what they uh, teach. Um, so roughly, um, like if you know about the geographic area and a time period, um, then um, you don't really have to have a module specifically related to it. You can ask uh, for supervision um, from, from, from uh, that uh, department member. And um, Critique has, um, has a question. Earlier students on the MA had to choose specific regional pathways um, but I think um, that has been discontinued now, right? As, uh, would we be able to combine courses from whichever regional focus um, we want? Absolutely, that's uh, basically um, abolished, discontinued, mainly to, to make uh, things more flexible, um, I, I, would, I would say. Um, I don't know if Andrea, Wayne or Lars would um, have um, thoughts on this. I mean, um, maybe just to continue this, um, this bit reluctant because my husband is cooking and it's, it feels like it's very noisy. Um, but um, I, I think it depends on your interest. So I, I, we, we always have students who have a particular interest in a particular region. So I think in that case, maybe you won't find, um, for example, enough history modules to make up an entire program in Chinese history. Um, so in that case, you, you might want to, to pick another module in an area studies department, but um, this is not necessarily what we want as a history program. I, I think that's, that's what I hope to get across with kind of emphasizing this, this, this last module that is interregional and tries to bring all these different perspectives together. But it doesn't exclude this um, or kind of, you still can focus on a particular region, but you probably, given the structure of the program and the number of history modules that you'll have to take, we'll have to look across one particular region in order to complete the program. And in my mind, that's actually a good thing. So, so you can do both, but ideally we want to have a slightly broader approach for this program. I mean, to add to what Andrea said, I mean, it's really helpful to look into other regions, mainly because I mean, the, the, the literature from those different regions um, kind of feed from different historiographical traditions. And that might be really helpful um, uh, for you to look at your own region um, in the end. I mean, I guess as historians, we have to focus on, I mean, we have to have an, a regional and um, time period expertise. Um, unless you're a global historian, I guess, I mean, still you need to have a time uh, period um, focus because it just really, you can't deal with the, the uh, massiveness of the um, of the um, sources and languages, etc. Um, so, um, so that that you will need anyway. But um, looking at different, as I said, different regions would really help um, you um, looking at your own material, own region differently. So, Pratik, the short answer is um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So 
just, just to give a concrete example, uh, if you um, are interested in the development of Southeast Asia, um, then you have to look at the um, role of Islam. And Islam is not from Southeast Asia, and the the vectors, the people who bring uh, the the teachings old and new, they 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 come from uh, well, typically from India. So you have to look at least at this, and then if you look at China, then you have um, the Western regions. You have uh, Xinjiang. You have uh, other parts which are actually very closely interrelated with Western Asia and with uh, the Arabian Peninsula. Um, so the, the, it's. Um, uh, if you do study um, if you study history at SOAS, then the world is your oyster, and you should actually um, enjoy it as much as possible. Perhaps we should ask if there were any questions about the independent research essay. Should I say something? Uh, no, I, I just wondered if, because uh, we've just spoken about the, the yeah. kind of top courses, and I just wondered if anybody had questions about the... Yeah, I mean, it's not compulsory or core anymore, so it can mm. be just, um, uh, it's just an optional course that it is um, kind of like a rehearsal of the dissertation. It's um, it's um, relatively um, long or like mid length essay that you connect this time, not to the supervisor, but to a module. And um, you you work on it as if you, you're working on a dissertation, as I said, it can be in preparation for your dissertation, but it can be um, uh, taken up in any other um, topic um, uh, as well uh, to, um, um, you know, if, if you're interested in a particular um, issue and you want to explore it, want to write your dissertation on a completely different topic, that can be um, a good way to do it. Maybe just to add to it, it it's kind of an outgrowth of an, another program that we ran a couple of years ago um, and that we had to withdraw for, for several reasons, which was an, a, a research MA. So, um, for example, if you have an, if you're thinking of continuing um, um, doing research, historical research after the MA, maybe want to proceed to a PhD project, the um, independent research project also can give you an opportunity to work more and more focused on a particular kind of question or, or area of research. Um, and, and you will have more space to pursue your individual interests rather than to have um, to fill up your program with taught courses. I think that that was the original intention of introducing this particular module. Just to add to the explanation. Okay, uh, do we have more questions? All right, um, how early should we reach out to a supervisor for our thesis? Good question. Um, does anybody want to answer? Um, I can answer. I mean, if you have a very clear idea about what you want to, I mean, we can just um, reach out to the supervisor immediately as you arrive. I mean, um, there's really no harm in that, and we actually would be happy to uh, to um, discuss with you. Um, that you know, that gives you extra time to to um, think about your course your modules and um, your um, your options outside the department and how you make um, your um, your dissertation research as um, as I mean as strong as, as strong as possible I guess um, so um, I mean there is no I mean it's it not no um, uh, time would be too early to reach out to your supervisor and that includes the time before the term starts, the uh, university year starts. I have students who write to me uh, in May, so before the summer, so that they can start reading for themselves. And they um, and others, you know, it, it really depends on your, uh, your life pattern and your plans for, you know, the, the entire year, uh, um, the 18 month year. And um, um, so before, after, um, 
um, you know, what you're going to do in the summer after you finish your course and while you're writing your dissertation, um, maybe you're busy. So you would want to prepare for that dissertation the year before, before the teaching actually starts. I've had students like that. So it's, um, it's, it's, it can be arranged in a very individual way. Lars just uh, spoke of the 18 month year, but can I say that in general, the MA is really a nine month year. Uh, for the vast majority of people. I mean, it runs from September, October through to May, June. Um, and there's the dissertation, which is normally due in September. Um, but in terms of, you know, the core of the MA is really only nine, which is, which is to say that it's a very demanding program. I mean, we actually, you have to do an enormous amount in a very short space of time. So to come back to the question about the dissertation, um, this, uh, to emphasize Shader's point, the sooner the better, really. Um, um, there's, there's no, you know, really, really it's, it's, it's something that should be started right at the start of the year, at the start of the academic year. I mean, I always say to students that, you know, the dissertation um, counts for one module. So in theory, you should spend as much time on the dissertation as you would on any other module. Um, so, you know, every, every hour that a taught module receives should have a matching hour for the dissertation. <laughs> Wayne, to, to uh, that, uh, sorry, uh, Wayne, to add to that, I mean, the dissertation is, as I said, it's a 10,000 word essay. It's not really um, that challenging overall. Um, but, you know, like to, to, to be able to write something that you yourself will be proud of, it, you know, and then, you know, happy with the research and the quality of the, the final, um, final um, um, output. It takes a lot of time. And historical research, um, archival research, research in primary sources takes a lot of time. You know, to, to find something that's good enough um, that you can write your, you, you know, base your work on. It you know it takes a lot of trial and error. And you know, the the, the um, earlier that you start, uh, the better. And for for that reason, I think contacting your uh, supervisors as early as possible. Uh, would help you with that just start with your even just with keyword searches and things like that looking around for for possible um possible uh, material so yeah a year is really quite short i mean you know in, in, in uh, for um for that okay so thank you I Currently, I can't see any further questions, and, and we're being reminded that it's um, seven o'clock. Um, so maybe we can um, we can we can uh, draw this to an end now. And I'd just like to emphasize: if if you do have further questions, um, um, please do um, not don't hesitate to contact us. You can you can contact uh, Chayla as program convener, or me as a subject head, or, or any other colleague. Really, maybe um, somebody who is working closer to the area of your particular interest. Um, so I'm not quite sure how we can um, circulate our contact details, but you'll find them all on the website. It should be quite easy to find. So please do get in touch. Um, and maybe it just um, remains to thank you all for for joining this session, spreading the news. <laughs> and, and I thank you all for, for joining. Um, and right, so thanks and have a nice rest of the evening, I guess. Yeah, and hopefully see you in September. <laughs> and hopefully see you in September, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Good, okay, thank you all. Take care, bye. <laughs>